Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency. This week, I want to recognize AR community member DJ Jablonski, who shared some figures from a really rad paper on our Discord. They got me curious, I had a little time to read the paper, and I realized there are ways that this answers two of the big question areas here on the channel right now. So the resources we're going to explore, the primary literature we're going to look at today, it's not consensus science, but it's so like right in our wheelhouse right now, we're going to look at it anyway. You'll be able to see the citation, follow along everything. So when I think about the big question areas here on the channel right now, people want to know what the heck AMOC is going to do in some real detail, right? Both globally and in the U.S. The AR community also wants to know how screwed are our people in the Gulf this coming summer, right? Let's dig in. We're going to intersect on sea surface temperatures. For the near-term outlook, we need the NOAA updates. Y'all know I keep an eye on the NOAA ENSO updates for you. We got this one out yesterday on the 20th, and you'll be surprised by this. The probability that we're going to leave the El Nino system has really increased dramatically. It looks like by April, we'll be out of the El Nino pattern and into La Nina. Unfortunately, that would set us up for an active hurricane season in the Gulf. A La Nina system tends to nurture more storms. It's being widely reported in both regional and national news that sea surface temperatures right in Hurricane Alley are really high right now. In fact, we're talking about temperatures in this region where storms blow in from the Atlantic into the Gulf being as hot now in February as they often are in June. And we can see the size of the anomaly here. Let's piece it together. We are looking at the potential for a hurricane system that'll kick off in late April, starting early, potentially running long. The shift to La Nina, it's a good in terms of global temperature outlooks, right? We've been running hot too many days lately where the global average is close to 2C. La Nina should bring that global average temperature down. Everything has costs though. And we might see that cost in the Gulf this season. With as hot as the Gulf is likely to get this hurricane season, what I would recommend is keeping your ear to the ground. If you're anywhere near the region, you could get rapid intensification and have a storm really blow up with little warming. <clears throat> I remember from Katrina, and this was a while ago, the storm changed paths fast. I had evacuated to Slidell to ride it out because even late that night, Slidell was out of the cone of impact probability. But as you may know, it, Slidell was not out of the cone. In Katrina, there were a lot of people who ended up doing same-day evacuation who had tried to plan ahead. People who live inland who've never experienced something like that, we got to cultivate compassion because even back then, even back in Katrina, things could take a quick turn. With the conditions we see in the Gulf right now, the potential for rapid intensification means that people may get very little warning and difficult to understand warnings if a big storm is on the way. This coming hurricane season, if we don't get smashed hard, it's really going to be just pure luck. In terms of tracks, there's some consensus that we're going to see more hurricanes hitting in towards the bend here in a warming climate, and that we expect more of them to take an inland path, maybe even going through Georgia and the Carolinas inland. There are some indications that the atmospheric conditions that are arising could also allow them to have more of like a wavy gravy action where they go back and forth before crossing the peninsula. Now, connecting, do we get more hurricanes with AMOC collapse? Because, you know, there's been some buzz that like, as you look at the AMOC models, some people say maybe it's better for life on earth if this switch flips sooner rather than later, because there are some areas that look like maybe they get a benefit if AMOC turns off, especially if we envision the continued warming that will still be occurring in conjunction with a down AMOC. I'm, I'm reluctant to say such things because AMOC collapse will be a catastrophic disaster. And also because it's like a real Northern hemisphere move to be like, oh, the Southern hemisphere sounds like it's really screwed in these big models. That said, how can we optimize the Northern hemisphere experience? But I wanna show you, this is really interesting in this new paper. We have Southern hemisphere land modeling. It is not what I expected. Let's check it out. All right, we're looking at this paper here in Nature Climate Change, Interbasin and Interhemispheric Impacts of a Collapsed Atlantic Overturning Circulation by Orjuela Pinto, England into Shadow. All right, here's figure two and holy cats, look at those hurricanes. Look at the potential for hurricanes there. It's crazy. Figure two is like a spoiler alert figure. The scientists, they made a model and in figure two, we're seeing it here. 
This model lets us look at super near time scale detailed AMOC collapse effects. And yeah, they're going to let us look at this in some detail, looking at temperature changes, precipitation changes, and big wind pattern changes. Figure two here, it's too much like one of those magic ideals. You're going to start tripping if you look at this too hard all at once. Let's go and do some breakdown by starting with figure three. All right, figure three, here's temperature changes. Pale orange is plus 1C, pale blue is minus 1C. Colombia, baby, look at you. South America, even Indonesia, is not seeing the sort of heat that we were led to believe when we talked about just northern versus southern hemisphere. If we look at the southern hemisphere heating, a lot of it is concentrated away in these models, which again, it's not consensus science. This is one pretty cool paper, but it's not a consensus paper like the NCA5. We see a lot of that heating based in the oceans, not in land masses. And even when we get out, so we've got years 1 through 10, 11 through 20, 21 through 30, 31 through 40. So even when we get out a couple generations into AMOC collapse, we don't expect to see the sort of catastrophic heat up we might have feared for the vast majority of land in the Southern Hemisphere. This is fantastic news for any of us who might have heard those early AMOC reports and given up hope. It's always worth waiting for more of the science. In Europe, too, I've had people comment on the channel, everyone in Europe is screwed. S some people in Europe are screwed. I mean, like, this is a really strong, really fast cold pattern. And this gives me some um, belief that the signal here, that the first way we'll know it's really gone down is this cold signal will appear in Europe. We'll see Europe have normal temperatures perhaps while we see record highs continuing in the US and over in inland Asia here. But Europe will become anomalous. We see that European temperature anomaly increasing. But look, I had said I had kind of a feeling that Central Europe, the effects would be moderated. Looks like it, looks like it. In the event of AMOC collapse, we don't expect the same sort of extreme chilling that looks like it's going to hit parts of Northern Europe. All right, do you feel like you need more details? Because I feel like I need more details. Let's get out of here and look at precipitation. We're going backwards. We're going back to figure two and zooming in. All right, so we're zoomed out on precipitation. This isn't the immediate change right after AMOC collapse. They don't have a broken out figure like they do for temperature. This is the average from 50 to 100 years after the switch has turned off. This is what would be the sort of stable-ish pattern. So we expect mild drought trend over much of the Northern Hemisphere. And when we talked about there being sort of a deformity entering the water cycle beneath the equator, this is really crazy. This looks like a very deformed water cycle to me right here. Thinking about rain and storms makes me think about changing winds. And we've had community members who pushed me to think more about wind since the beginning of this channel. I think that some of you folks are gonna like this figure. We're gonna look at figure four. So look at this, this is visualizing pressure climbs. We're looking at the shape of the winds in the first four decades after AMOC turns off is what we're modeling here. And look at them, we can visualize these moving winds and the precipitation they might drive. Looking back to hurricanes, we can see an inescapable, generational descent of powerful hurricanes into the Gulf. That is wild. We see these great storms forming in Europe, impacting what looks like the entire MENA region. Looks like Middle East and North Africa are getting sucked into the mix of this crazy wind pattern. Looking over towards Asia, I think this pattern over India is very interesting, where we see this high pressure pattern shifting perhaps bringing an increasing stability, an increasingly stable low pressure monsoon driving pattern where, you know, with the continued warming pathway, the big fear is the monsoon shutting off. This looks like potential restabilization of the monsoon over India. I hope so. Looking inland in the Midwest, look, there's a couple of bubbles that start orange and then they stay orange. Right there, the bottom of what was the top there stays orange. This area, stays orange all the way. Those line up pretty well with the best part of the Palouse and the Northern Midwest, two currently identified destination regions related to their potential in the event of continued warming. And they looked good in the big picture modeling of AMOC collapse. So that's more details, more points in the favor of those two destination regions. I think this is totally fascinating. And I'm sure there's much more to see in this figure and much more detail in this report than I've shared with you today. But I do wanna look at one more thing 
for our practically minded friends. I know you're out there, logistics people. Whoever has asked in their heart, what would AMOC do to shipping? This is the figure you're gonna like, figure six. This figure is so cool. It's such a detailed schematic and the Atlantic is gonna be so messed up that like you can't read anything that's going on there. But if you're interested in the Pacific trade, right? We see uh, intensified trade winds and uh, strengthened walker circulation in the Pacific, which potentially could be a small benefit to accomplishing trade over that global route. That's just from this metric. I know there are many other factors. Disclaimers. If all of this paper is making you feel like, what oh, collapse sounds kind of fun. I think that you're forgetting some important elements. I mean, like, did you check out that all the bad stuff, all the heat, all the big deformities, they're concentrated around Antarctica and in the ocean. So it looks bad for the ocean and bad for sea level rise. If AMOC goes down and you aren't comfortably inland, the impacts on coastal cities around the globe, while not immediate, will be devastating. International trade is going to be really messed up. The water cycle right below the equator is gonna be super weird. It'll probably kill the Amazon rainforest. And I think that if you, like me, enjoy breathing air with a very particular percentage of oxygen, you should be concerned about these big hits to biodiversity, both in the land and in the sea. You know, what can we do, right? In the face of such big problems. All we can do is our best. We gotta do our best to support the diversity of life on earth, the abundance of life on earth, and try and get as much of our fellow living things through this with us as we can. It's important to go beyond thinking about just ourselves. But there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed this little exploration. All due to DJ Jablonski's independent find of this super cool paper. It's well cited. The modeling is pretty sweet. Let's get the authors up there again to recognize them. It's worth noting this paper fits the paleoclimate models. It fits the physical evidence that we have from back in Earth's history from the last times AMOC shut down. It's good to have that sort of reality check when we're looking against computer modeling systems. I was surprised that we are capable of this sort of super fine decade scale modeling. I thought that was really interesting. It's a finer quality of math that I can really do. I cannot say that I have been able to do a critical review of this paper. This is a situation where we're not dealing with consensus science. We have to trust in the peer review process. I'm sure that this was not a simple thing to get published. And this paper was really fun. Paper authors, all three of you are super cool. On a personal note, I hope that you're getting outside if you can and enjoying this super weird spring here in the continental US. It's important to enjoy life, to connect with people and with the earth. If you want to put some seed in early on the garden, go nuts. Who's going to stop you? If you want to keep enjoying life, I would get ready for summer if I were you. I'd get an air purifier. It's going to be an active fire season. And make a plan, you and the people you're close to, in case of extreme heat and utility outages. These moments count. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for being here with me. The support for American resiliency is just incredible. People have given so much to this project. It's the reason why I'm able to keep doing it. I want you to know this uh, last month is the first month that we are off the runway. We are on target to being able to be with you, keeping an eye on the news, trying to get you the information you need indefinitely. Thank you so much for everyone here with me. Talk to you again soon.